Welcome to Marine Works by Helena Walker, Alex Holloway, and Miles Hamilton. Just basically an overall gist. Here are the different types of marine worms that we will be talking about in this presentation. Um, and each phylum. So we will be talking about flatworms, ribbon worms, round worms, arrow worms, deep sea tube worms, and segmented worms. Just uh, an overall kind of basic about what marine worms are. They mostly live in the benthic area of the ocean column, which is the very bottom with the sediment in the mud and sand. Most are segmented, which is basically like showing you like its growth habits, just like each little, it's basically like in sections um, when it grows. Most can regenerate, which is basically if it splits apart or like something falls off, it's able to regenerate something again regenerate the same thing and most are hermaphroditic which is when the organism has a male and female uh, sex organ so these are some just different types of organisms that, uh, of some marine worms that we'll be talking about here is a round worm this is a ribbon worm here's the arrow worm here's the uh, giant tube worm uh, leeches and the uh, flatworm now uh, Specifically, these three photos um, really show the uh, segmentation of the marine worms, such as the lovely famous tapeworm we have right here. You can see each section, and so that's what it means by segmentation. Um, and then also for the giant tube worms, you can see the little notches that basically represent like its growth and habits so it's basically segmented and then for the leech you can see with the light and the darkness the uh, sections the uh, segmentation that it has so that just kind of also shows a uh, good example of segmentation and about uh, an overall of what most each of the uh, marine worms that we're going to be talking about kind of look like so flatworms how flat term, flatworms obtain and use energy. So they obviously have a mouth on the underside of the body, which in these two pictures show here and here. Um, they are carnivores. They feed on de decaying body, um, like such as detritus. Uh, they have a chemical detecting where they're able to sense if there is a decaying body nearby, basically, and they're able to uh, find it and use it for nutrients. Obviously, these that is for the uh, free living flatworm for the parasites, which I'll talk about later. Uh, they feed on their host, and that's when they uh, t that's how they take their nutrients. Um, one of the interesting things about a uh, flatworm is that when they take in food, it's split into two digestive tracts. One spreads the nutrients, um, and the other releases the waste and the one thing I find interesting is that the flatworm actually does not have an anus so when it releases waste it yes it uh, releases it through the mouth so I just thought that was very interesting senses and response to the environment so as I was talking about it lives in the pelagic pelagic zone which is kind of like near the um the uh coastal drop off of the ocean but it's obviously it still lives in the the uh the mud the sand rocks and seaweed kind of the benthic zone um it can live flatworms can live in either fresh or salt water um one of the longest they can grow up to uh 20 meters in length there are 10,000 different species 80 percent are parasites 20 percent are free living and they don't have circulatory skeletal or respiratory systems um, I like these two photos because this one shows a uh, free living flatworm, um, kind of in in the open, it's like in coral, just around its home habitat. And this is one of the parasites of a uh, flatworm that are very so it's a microscope picture. It's very small, it's got little eyes and tail. So yeah, growth then reproduction. Um, as I was saying before, um, her they uh about hermaphroditic the flatworm flatworms are one of the people that one of the organisms that are hermaphroditic um which is uh you know they can move sexually as they uh have male and female sex organs and they can fertilize each other which is 
like itself which is reciprocal copulation and um they can produce hundreds of eggs and badges and they attach it to a surface and then those uh eggs become larvae and then they are larvae that's really when they uh especially the uh, parasite ones do the most damage because when you're young you need the most nutrients you can get and of course they like latch onto a host and um attack it by taking most uh most of its uh nutrients for its for itself asexually is when they uh split apart so uh which is what i was talking about how they can regenerate so basically if they uh if a flatworm ever spits apart, the two parts can become a whole nother flat worm again, which is very interesting. And then the parasites for, uh, as I said before, par the parasites for the flatworms rely on their host to, mo of, uh, to survive for most of their lifespan. How they exhibit movement. As I was talking about bilateral symmetry before, this picture also shows another example how it's nice. Just kind of cut it down the middle. It's both like the same on each side. It's very interesting. Um, how they move. They move head back and forth. They also have help from cilia, which is on the bottom side. Um, or the ventricle side. And then these little ripples in the uh, in its body also kind of allow it to move by kind of like pushing it. Because uh, there'll be like waves and they'll basically just be like moving it along the bottom. Um, how it adapts to its environment. Um, well, one, they can, for especially the free living, can dig under the sand and hide from predators. Um, and then also if they, if the, uh, if they are attacked, they can, uh, regenerate from, if they were, like, split apart or, like, damaged, though so they can regenerate specific parts or that part. Um, and then one of the things that I especially did with these two photos I did was camouflage. Um, I chose this one because it shows a flatworm kind of in its environment that's kind of like milky color, um, kind of same color of the sediment of the mud, and it kind of has camouflage, um, and so if it also were to dig in the sand, it would be very camouflaged because it'd be around the same color as the mud. And then for the more colorful ones, more colorful ones tend to live in like the coral, which is as the coral is very colorful, so... They kind of blend in equally. We're going to switch gears now, and now we're going to start talking about ribbon worms. How ribbon worms um, obtain and use energy. Well, one of the things that they have is a proboscis. And uh, this is a nice picture of a proboscis right here. It's not real, but it basically shows you overall the, the idea of it. Um, the proboscis is a sharp extension that is hidden in the head region that releases a sticky mucus that stuns the animal. So uh, when a ribbon worm sees a prey, it uh, probably go it, um, goes near it and then it sticks it out. And the sticky mucus, as, I, as it said, stuns it and then they're able to uh, um, eat it. <laughs> the... Uh, the head region, here's a little, little example right here, it's a little awkward photo, but it, it, I like the photo because it showed what I want to specifically talk about. Um, the head region right here has uh, hooks, hooks kind of right at the top, that latch onto a host, and then they use little suckers, and there's these suckers right here that gather nutrients, such as um, just like the blood that carries all the good nutrients and stuff. Um, senses and response to the environment. Well, they live in the intertidal zone. Their prey are small fish. And as I was just talking about, their protection is the uh, proboscis. Most are free living, few are parasites, and the parasites that do live inside clams or oysters or our favorite tapeworm that is found in animals or even sometimes humans. Growth and reproduction. Um, they can, they are hermaphroditic, so they can reproduce sexually and asexually. Again, sexually is, um, they can fertilize each other or itself. It's called reciprocal copulation. Again, they have eggs and that turn to then larvae. Um, they can also produce asexually, so if they split apart, they can regenerate, just kind of like the flatworms, which is how kind of all these marine worms kind of fit together. And also for especially the parasitic, uh, ribbon worms they rely on their hosts most of their lifespan as i said they are segmented um i like this photo 
for especially the segment for the segment part because it really shows each different segment that kind of when a tapeworm or especially a ribbon worm grows like it shows it and then they have a circulatory system due to its length because it's very long. The longest tapeworm that's ever been found is in a whale, and it was 30 meters long, which is around 90 feet. Um, so obviously these organisms can get very huge and long, and so they need a strong circulatory system to support every single bit of it. How it exhibits movement? Well, they have cilia on its uh, on the back side. I kind of, you can't, they're obviously microscopic so you can't see, but also they do an undul undulating motion where they kind of like spring forward. Um, how it adapts to its environment. They can uh, dig into sand. Um, and also this picture shows, first of all, that they're a little segmented with the little ridges and also the little cilia that aren't microscopic. They're quite bigger. They're more like little legs, but... I like this photo. These are ribbon worms. Um, they can uh, dig into the sand, and then because these are not colorful ribbon worms, they're kind of like more dull and mucky. They like they camouflage into the uh, mud and dirt and sand, which is very nice. Um, so they're able to do that, and then they uh, produce a mucus that they can allow to. Uh, uh, that allow like kind of like dirt and rocks to kind of like continue staying on its body. So if it moves around, it it's better camouflaged.